We're specializing in audio visuals today. There we go. There we go. It's a lot of the Thank you. Okay. Can you guys hear? Yes. yes. All right. Thanks for inviting uh, me. I always like talking to you. Yeah. So I've done it a few times before. It's always fun. It's always twice as big as the time before. Um, it's hardly an empty seat in place. It's pretty amazing. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk um, about interfaces and how I use them to solve a problem that is in Go, but in some weird way it's sort of not about Go. So first some background. Um, at GopherCon a few months ago, I gave a talk about the new Go assembler. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that assembler is implemented. But uh, it's not really a talk about assembly at all. But if you're interested in a talk about system design and portability and generating you know, instruction data from reading PDFs from instruction manuals, you can see that talk online. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the lecture inside that assembler. And the reason I'm doing that is partly because I really like how it turned out. It was a fun little problem. But also it kind of fits. Because a few years ago, at a very early Sydney Go meetup, I talked about a different lecture, completely unrelated to this one. Uh, it uses concurrency, and it was more of a sort of finger exercise than something you really want to use in production, although it is in the Go tree for the template type. Um, this one is uh, much more realistic as a production lecture, and it's all about interfaces. So, for those of you who don't know, I think most of you do, the lecture is also sort of formally called a scanner. Uh, takes the input stream and breaks into tokens. So you get things, it right, and that pulls out the, the words, if you like, in the input. Picking out identifiers, numbers, quoted strings, operators, that kind of thing. Um, and then generally some garbage, uh, like commas and colons that don't really fit anything, but are necessary to be parsed. And the thing about the lecture that's important is you get two values for every item. You get the actual text or value of that token, and you also get a type. So for example, looking at an instruction assembly language, um, if you have an instruction like this for some generic architecture, the lecture would turn that line of text into the stream with an identifier move queue, an identifier R0, character comma, and so on. And everything coming out of the lecture is those pairs with the type and the value. And part of the part of the lectures here are the spaces that just thrown away. Comments are largely treated like spaces. You'll we'll see a little thing about comments later. And then these, this stream of, of pairs gets delivered to the parser, which builds that input into the parse tree, which are not going to Okay, now Go actually has two scanners in the main repository. There's the Go scanner, which is um, used for scanning in regular Go code. We can't really use that because it knows too much about Go. It's got keywords in it that aren't relevant here that would cause problems. It's sort of a general purpose all around scanner. It knows what string, knows what number, knows what identifier. So it can actually do this job just fine, and you think you could just use it. But, as always, life is never as simple as you want, because the new Go assembler, uh, we saw written in Go, was replacing a suite of assemblers written in C that had their own idiosyncrasies. It was actually an interesting problem converting the tree so that you got rid of all the C code that was used to build the Go system and switch it to Go. You can see a talk about that, but that's not really what this is about. However, the key point is we do have to maintain as best we can, as nearly 100%, perfect compatibility with the assemblers that we were replacing. The problem with those guys is they were way ahead of the game because when Ken wrote the, the first assembler that was in the suite that became the Go assemblers, uh, he had a C compiler at his disposal, and so he implemented the lecture by typing two lines of code. Number include dot dot slash cc slash lexbody, and number include dot slash cc slash macbody, thereby literally stealing the C compiler's lecture and putting it in the assembly. And I don't have a C compiler anymore, so that won't work. But also, this doesn't work anyway. It had the effect of, of a really simple implementation, um, but it also brings in something really, really tricky. And that is because C has a C preprocessor. Now, in the C compiler that we were using and that Go used, 
um, the C compressor is part of Alexa. It's not a separate process. And of course, because of that, there was assembly language programs all over the tree that were using the C processor to do things like define constants, make macros, make pseudo instructions, and things like that. And I think most of you probably know the C processor, at least superficially. Uh, you can do things like include a file, which just takes the constant file and pretends it's right in line or the good thing it is. You can define constants, like your max buff file 12. You can also define macros that take arguments that expand into whatever the textual versions of those arguments are when the macro is invoked. And then there's this conditional inclusion feature called ifdef um, that you can use to enable or disable blocks of code according to whether or not a symbol is defined. Modern C has a, well, C89 and onwards, uh, has a much, much, much fancier C preprocessor, which I need to get to. But this is what was in the plan 9 one. It's all we need. It's all that was implemented. And therefore, all that be compatible. And the simple fact is the text scanner factories can't do this. It's simply not enough to love it. So we have to implement it. And so this talk is about how to implement a C preprocessor in Go using interfaces. So some background. Everyone knows what standard input is. It's a source of input. Now, what about if you're including a file in a number include statement? Kind of the same thing. You open the file, you read it. It's just like the same idea, right? It's, it's an abstraction. What about a macro implication? What if you see, if you define maxbuff 512, and then you see maxbuff as a word inside the input? You want to convert that into its definition. So that's kind of like opening up the macro definition and interpolating that, or reading the macro definition. So there's a certain pattern here, right? It sounds an awful lot like an hyperbot reader. However, it's not quite, because it's not really bytes that we're reading here. Iota reader reads bytes. We want tokens. And the reason, remember, we want tokens is we're giving these to a parser. Our job is to find the boundaries in the byte stream, deliver tokens that are pairs of type and value. It's really not a reader. The read interface won't work for us. But we want something quite analogous, which we can abstract and call a token reader. And it has a single method that says read a token that returns a token, which is one of these tuples, uh, conceptually at least, and an error. But otherwise, it has some of the same flavor. And then we can build a lexer around this interface. So what happens then? Well, you get standard input. What does that do? You read tokens from the input. When you include a file, you read tokens from the input the file.
running. So consider what happens when you're running. You're running over the text. You see number include. You want to file. You want to process that file. And then you hit EF in the file. You go back to the old guy. But what if that include file includes a, another include file? Well, then you're going to put another include file. And then he's going to come back. He's going to come back. It's a stack. It's actually a stack of token readers that you want. Because when you get a new input source, whether it's an include file or an assembler source file or a macro invocation, you just push that out of the stack. Once that is exhausted, you go back to the previous state. And so we need a stack of token readers. And because this is Go, we're going to make that stack of token readers implement token reading. Because why wouldn't we? Right? So here's, here's, how, here's pretty much the implementation, the whole thing. Um, a stack is just a bunch of token readers as a slice. And oops, why did you do that? I don't want that. Screw you. I hate this stuff. I might as well turn that off. Someone should have a startup that you run a thing when you're giving a talk that turns off Microsoft and Apple telling you your machine has to get updated. <laughs> um, so we have a stack of token readers. Um, the one thing we're going to need that's not in the token reader interface, of course, the ability to push a new token reader on the stack. And because of the way Go slices work, it's easiest to put it at the end. <coughs> so we're going to just append the new input on the end of the slice of token readers. But the pop is going to happen automatically when we do next. And here it is. In next, you say, what is the top of stack? That's the last guy in the slice. Um, and by construction, you arrange that it's always a safe thing to do that, that indexing. Um, you call the top of stack, which is a token reader. Call his next method. You get a token back. And now, if the token is EOF and there's still guys left, you just pop it and recur on the previous guy in the stack. So you pop the stack and try this guy. Eventually, when you pop back, you don't have anybody left, and that EOF is the real EOF, and you're done with the input. So there's a stack, implements token reader. I think you can write the text implementation for the stack token reader. And so we now have all the pieces we need to build a C preprocessor. And I've shown you most of the code. There's, there's a little bit more. There's some fiddly bits. But that's pretty much a, a CPP. Now, to put it all together, finally, there's a thing called an input which wraps all this together. And this is input. There's one of them. And it's given to the parser. This is the type the parser gets as its token reader. Of course, it implements token reader. And the way it implements token reader is it just embeds the stack inside it. See the first field inside the input? That's an embedded implementation of the stack. And so it is a stack. And all of its methods, by default, will come from the stack. But we're going to cheat in a minute. I'll show you that. It's got some other data. It needs to know what the directories are that number includes can come from. It needs the symbol table. You saw how we built that. Uh, it's also got some helpers like the text from the last token, because that's helpful to have. OK, so everybody got that? So the only thing we need now is some pieces to handle the magic that happens at the top level, like number include and number define. And number include is a little easier, so I'll show you that one. Um, so what you're, you're, looking, you're running through the input, and the token you get is a, a hash, or an octothorpe, as we call it at the lab. So I know we didn't. Um, you say number include. You've seen the include. You call this method. And it implements the interpolation of the contents of the file name by the include. So that's easy. You look at the next token in the input. That's supposed to be a quoted string. That's the file name you're going to open. And that should be followed by a new line. So you can see the check there, expecting a new line that'll give you an error and shut you down. It's not there. Um, now you've got to find the file that you're going to push onto the stack. And because of the way CPP works, it might not be the actual name. You might have to look for it in a set of directories. So first, you try opening the actual name. If that works, you've got it. But if it didn't work, then you range over the includes, which are just the names of directories that might have the file, and keep trying looking for that file in those directories. Eventually, we hope you find one. And so the error is nil, and you break. And now, the grand finale, input.push, new tokenizer of name, fd, fd. And now you've just interpolated a file onto the stack. And off you go. OK? Macro definition, pretty much the same idea. It's a little different. But you, know, you see number defined. You do some processing, build the macro. But you're not invoking it this time. You're just ignoring the text of the macro definition itself. Um, you install it in input.macros, and then when you see the invocation, you get it. So now we're at the last piece that really matters, which is input.next. This is the guy that stitches all of this together. So here's uh, the input stream for a C preprocessor using token readers, stacks, slices, all this stuff. 
So the parser is going to call this method. I need the next thing from you. And what it does is it, first of all, there's this weird for loop. And that's because uh, the super processor is a macro language. Macro languages can be infinitely recursive. And that's, of course, bad, but you've got to catch it. Like if they define number define A to B, a number define B to A, and then you invoke A, it could loop forever. So there's just a counter here to make sure we don't go too far to catch it when the, when the program makes a mistake and generates recursion. That's all that's about. It's not interesting. Now, pull the next thing off the stack. If it starts with a number sign, you call the hash function, which it looks at the next token, decides whether to define or include or whatever. Um, otherwise, if it's an identifier, it might be a macro name, in which case you've got to look it up inside the macro table. If you find a definition for it, invoke that macro and go around and try again. Um, otherwise, uh, you've got a regular token, and that's sort of the default case. So you fall through to this code, which is very simple. It's a little bit like the stuff in the stack implementation. If you're DOF, um, but now the problem is um, there's if def, which means if you get if def and end if, the code in here might or might not be included. And you have to keep track of that. If the if def is enabled, you're going to keep the code. If it's not enabled, you can throw the code away. But there's this function in here called enabled that is just knows the state of that Boolean, whether you're including or not. Obviously, it starts out true and can go false. The problem is if you run out of input, when you're supposed to be looking for an end if, that's an error. So that's what this little check is for. Finally, you get to the bottom of the code. You're enabled. The input's there. You've got the token. You set, remember what the text was for the token you've got, and that's the one you give to the parser. And that's the whole thing. So that's a C preprocessor with the pieces that we've built. OK? And then initializing, it's really easy. You just establish it in the obvious way. I showed you the predefined function. You just make a list of, of the arguments for the minus i flag, which is how you set the include directory. Same idea. And then to get it started, you just call in.push on the original file name. Off to the races. And it'll just, the parser will just read by calling input.next until there's nothing left to get. And you've now implemented the front half of an assembler. And you can go to see my other talk about what happens in the back half. So in summary, um, I think this is one of the most fun versions, fun programs I've written using Go interfaces. It's not very much code, but you've got some pretty nice things going on. And I also think it's a little bit educational for people who haven't programmed with interfaces before. You might think of this as an object-oriented problem and design a type hierarchy. There's nothing wrong with that. But this is a different model. And it's a way, but you'll also notice that it really structures the program to think about implementing this one interface through all the pieces that are doing it. And it, the, the, the thing I like about the way Go interfaces work is they really encourage you to think about breaking the problem down into simple things that you can implement and then combine or compose into the real problem you're trying to solve. We've got stacks and slices and files and so on. But in the end, they all just become readers of tokens or streams of tokens. And we actually implement an interface that is implemented by a stack of itself, which I think is kind of fun. Not particularly profound, but it is kind of fun. And that idea that the, the divisions are really clean is really important. When you all you have between these pieces is that interface. The stack is literally a stack of token readers. It doesn't know anything about the, what token readers they are. They might be macro definitions, files, more stacks, because of course it can be mutually recursive. Number defined can invoke a macro that invokes another macro that includes a file. It's all possible. And it all just works because the, the structure is, is so clean. Um, and so we get to implement these various things of what is normally a pretty messy problem, building a C preprocessor in a fairly modest amount of code using this one interface. And so I just want to close by saying all of this was made possible by Robert's really excellent text scanner package underneath it all that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting for me. I'm just using it, building this stuff all above that. So I want to make sure you understand there's something there as well. Thank you very much. Any questions? That's the way I like it. Stunned, <laughs> stunned you all to silence. No, yes, one person. How did I decide that 100 is the right level of recursive depth? Um, I can imagine someone eventually doing 10 
Like it, number defines nesting to 10, includes and defines, and you could, I can imagine 10, although you rarely see more than two. There's no reasonable program that would have macros nested 100 deep. So it's, let's call it judgment. That's really what it is. <laughs> yes? Yeah, um, the other guys that were talking about debugging Go, and uh, they mentioned a lot of different uh, controls and problems and things like that. And they just get doing that kind of thing. With, with your stuff, do you tend to write the tests and no debugging? So if you, if you actually get to debugging, it doesn't sort of plan for months. Well, I don't use debuggers much because I'm old school. And when I was learning the program, the debuggers didn't work, so I didn't worry about them. They lie to you. They're much better now, but I'm used to not using them. I just built a lot of test cases. Um, as I, I talked a little bit about how I tested this stuff in the talk I gave at GopherCon, the most interesting part was we had a bunch of assembly source files, and I had to assemble them. And what, what I built was a little structure with some help from tools Russ, that Russ had, that I would assemble the program with the old assembler and the new one, and it would dump out if they weren't bitwise identical. And I just tracked them down until they were identical. And once we could do the whole tree with either assembler, we threw the old one away. That's, that's a really good way to test. So in some sense, yes, I did build the test first, except other people had built them. They were all the assembly we had. And some of them were very, very difficult to get working right. There were a lot of subtleness in things like the runtime and how that worked. So it was, they were really good tests. There's real tests for the assembler as well now, though. I mean, it's not just, you know. <laughs> The code uh, in the back. Uh, the third argument to was a new tokenizer is a file instead of a closer. It could have been a closer. It doesn't really matter. It's only going to be a file. Um, you're right for cleanliness. It probably should be a closer. In the back. Uh, the assembler is written as a single binary. The input is the assembler source file. The output is a .o file that goes to the linker. It's a single program. There's no parallelism. Or, actually, there is now. Someone changed it so you can assemble multiple files. But that was not my work. But fundamentally, it's just one program, input, output, and the output goes to the linker. Uh, there's a fair bit more detail about how this is all put together in the talk I gave at GopherCon. So if you're interested, I suggest you look there. Yes? Let's bring it back to the previous talk that we gave about using the channel. Um, we use channels to actually do some of this communication mm -hmm. and that's what we but in this one that's not the case, is that so um, the previous talk I gave on scanning at Sydney was using concurrency. That was because I wanted to write a concurrent program that would be fun to write. And and it showed a certain model of thinking about lexical processing because of the way it coordinates. Um, this is a completely different program, different problem different solution. Um, the concurrent scanner is probably more expensive than this by a significant factor, which matters when you're talking about a build system, less important when you're parsing templates. Um, and if I were doing the uh, template guide today, I might well use the original, the, the text scanner package itself rather than write a new one. But having written that, I wanted to use it. So that's all. That was more of a pedagogical exercise. This is more production code. Maybe one more question? Oh, yep. Um, or kind of like, um, it's not a lot of code, it's there, right? So I wanted to understand how much time you spend thinking about the problem and how to solve it versus how to like, actually write the code. OK, he said there's not much code there. And you're right, it's not much. I measure it. It's about the whole thing, which is a complete C for us, is about 900 lines. I probably showed you around 150, 200 of it. There's some fiddly bits around macro argument processing and stuff like that, but it's mostly the same. Um, and then there was a fairly long tail of, of debugging corner cases because the C preprocessor has very peculiar semantics, and you've got to get them right. Um, but that was okay. Um, I wrote the original version of this, pretty much what I've showed you today, um, probably very close to what I showed you today in an afternoon. Um, and the, I sort of thought about it. I, I, I proposed to Russ that I write the assembler because I had an idea about what the assembler would be. And then he said, great, why don't you do that? And then I realized, oh, god, I have to write a C preprocessor. Um, 
And so I spent some time thinking about that. I probably thought about it more than I spent writing it. because I mean, you can see the design just kind of falls out. It's, it was very simple. Um, turning it into the real production parser and assembler, that was a lot more work. But uh, And getting the corner cases right was a while. I probably spent a few days max on all of this. But you know, there's a lot you're not seeing. It took a lot more time after that. It wasn't hard. The design, when the design's right, the code practically writes itself. That's, that's the way you want it to be. Right? Thank you very much. Hope to see you again soon. Are you guys done? You guys... OK, there's more to come. Oh, you need me. You want this, don't you? Yes.